Hello, this is Aubrey Hicks, and I am the Executive Director of the Bedrosian Center at USC. And you are joining us for The Bigger Picture, a series where we interview scholars about how their research can make our communities better and more democratic. Today, we're going to speak to Kristen Sue from the Policy Evaluation Research Unit at Manchester Metropolitan University and Gary Painter from USC Price's Center for Social Innovation. We're going to talk about a relatively recent decade-ish um, addition to the toolbox for creating programs to, to deliver public services. So before we begin, let me have you guys introduce yourselves. So let's begin with Chris. Can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Chris Fox. I am Professor of Evaluation and Policy Analysis at Manchester Metropolitan University, where I'm Director of the Policy Evaluation Research Unit. And I've been uh, looking at the uh, idea of social impact bonds and the way in which they can potentially create new innovative approaches to delivering public services for about 10 years now. 10 years now. Excellent. Sue, can you tell us about yourself? Yes. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me also. I'm a colleague of Chris Fox's at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm a, a professor. My job title is Professor of Social Enterprise. Um, I have a long-standing interest in uh, innovation in social programs and in the topic of uh, co-creation and different relationships between service providers and people who, who use those services. I'm a relatively recent um, entrant into the area of social impact bonds, but uh, I, 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 it is a, a strong interest in something I think deserves uh, uh, further thought. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. And both of you, it's late there, so thank you. Uh, Gary. Can you tell our audience about yourself? Sure, I'm just completing my silver anniversary at the Price School. I've been a professor here for 25 years and um, I direct the Price Center for Social Innovation. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, and my own research in the last decade has moved into the field of social innovation to see how new tools and processes can generate solutions to some of our more complex problems. And to that end, um, I've had a, the privilege of collaborating with Chris and now Sue uh, studying social impact bonds as a tool to accomplish that goal. So I'm excited to have this conversation to reflect back on the last decade of social impact bonds and see where we go from here. Excellent. So let's start with something really basic. What is a social impact bond? Shall I begin? And Chris, you can fill in the gaps for our UK audience. <laughs> sure. So a social impact bond is actually not a bond, and that's it's a it's a misnomer. But because it ha it can earn a rate of return for investors, it's become colloquially known as a social impact bond. You know, for U.S. Um, listeners, you can think of it as a performance contract, um, where you set up goals and objectives, and if those goals and objectives are met, then it gets paid. What makes it unique and different from a standard performance contract is that a social impact bond structure is set up where you have investors um, who are paying upfront a service provider to deliver an objective. And those investors have tended to be from the, in the U.S., the philanthropic sector, um, as well as private sector. Um, and in other in, in the context of the UK, you see more of a blending of the philanthropic or social enterprise sectors and the and the public sector that kind of generated some of the upfront payment. And then what happens in terms of if you meet the performance targets, you actually have the government as the typical back end pay. And so it's the separation of who the investors are and who the payers are the payer is based on performance, which makes it a unique tool. Um, and as we'll talk about, it provides opportunity potentially for innovation, sharing of risk, and, and you know, overcoming constraints that might be there. And, and that's why the term pay for success in the U.S. has also gained salience, because the government doesn't have to pay unless the actual outcome is achieved. Um, so that's, that's uh, it, you know, my, my quickest definition. Chris, is there anything um, for our UK audience you'd like to add? No, I think that, that pretty much sums it up, Gary. I think, you know, certainly in the UK, the idea of, of paying for outcomes rather than simply paying for service delivery has been a really attractive idea to put politicians on both sides of the political divide over the last 10 years or so, particularly after the the financial crash of 2008-9. But even before then, there was a lot of interest in this, this concept of 
paying for what you get rather than simply paying paying for a service. Yeah, and as we were saying before, the notion about um, outcome based commissioning is quite commonly used in the UK to convey that so that notion. So um, my biggest question is: it seems like when we're talking about investors. Um, you know, is it could be one downside could be that there are some bad actors who are using the idea of um, making something in the community, doing something um, just as a way to make money. So what kinds of safeguards are there um, to make sure this isn't the case? Like who gets to determine what projects are greenlit? Who defines success measurements? Who does the measuring? I mean, that's a lot of questions, but um, that's my <laughs> overall. How how do we protect um, the communities that are being affected? I think that's a really interesting question and probably has slightly different answers in the UK and the US. So, for instance, the US SIBs that have been launched have tended to have quite rigorous impact evaluations attached to them, quite often randomised controlled trials or something similar. Whereas in the U in the UK, uh, there have been relatively few formal impact evaluations of SIBs, and instead, the reliance has been more on on governance structures and clear definition of metrics and um, measurement in order to sort of monitor what's happening and ensure uh, you know that the, the process is is fair and reasonably transparent. Um, so I think I think the answer sort of does differ depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. One of the authors in, in our briefings commented: in some cases in in the UK, there have been instances of uh, rigorous impact evaluation being uh, uh, dropped for possibly good reasons. But um, that does you know reinforce the point that Chris was making really that 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 it is less common in the UK and 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 that. Has led some people to criticise the uh, for lack of transparency because that uh, very rigorous evaluation isn't always enforced. Yeah, I think um, what's helped in the U.S. is not just the focus on rigorous evaluation of outcomes, but also the fact that the contracts have been made available widely. You know, so people can actually review them. And actually, one of the the folks that we've been working with on this brief series on what's next for SIBs. Um, actually is a lawyer at NYU, and she's gone through every contract and and really been able to assess a variety of, of issues. And the other part that can help, although it doesn't guarantee anything, is that there's a pretty broad array of stakeholders that are involved in the process of setting up a contract. So it's not just bilateral between you know, the government and a service provider or between an investor and a service provider, but in fact, um, you know, a broad constituency of folks are involved in the process. Um, but as we'll talk about today, perhaps not broad enough. Okay. So that gets me to the, you know, who who's determining the, the project. So how do some of these, so it's going to differ from place to place, but how do, um, how do projects get created? Um, so you're talking about different stakeholders. Um you know, so it's not a top down, you know, the government decides and then goes to a contractor and. Yeah. So in the UK, a lot of social impact bonds have uh, been uh, kind of seeded through central government funds set up specifically to encourage social social investment type contracts. So the, the, the largest and the most recent one has been the Life Chances Fund, which was a uh, a, a quite a large fund that, that essentially allowed, I think, um, something in the region of 20 new social impact bonds to be developed, not all of which then ultimately were turned into full social impact bonds, but, but allowed a, a number of new projects to be developed. And the idea there was that the government made a certain amount of funding available to local government, largely, so that if local government was going to be the payer for an outcome that could be topped up by central government and the idea of then of being a competition allowed people to sort of bid for uh, projects uh, and put forward ideas and those ideas to be tested through a through a sort of competitive bidding process um, so that that has tended to be the kind of approach in the UK and there have been a number of those kind of uh, funds set up over the last 10 years to stimulate activity some of which allow for a top-up fund to pay for part of the outcome, some of which have been 
funds that simply um, make some money available for business case work prior to a social impact bond being set up. But I think it's a bit different in the US, isn't it, Gary? It is. And I think it's still quite varied, you know, kind of the, the reasons why you might have seen a social impact bond structure advanced as opposed to just having government and or philanthropy, you know, put money into a program that they have seen pilot results or promising results somewhere else. And they either want to scale it up or try it in their new jurisdiction. Um, and I think in part, you know, the way I like to think about it is that kind of the first round of social impact bonds in the U, the U.S. context in particular, there was typically either a political constraint or a budget constraint. And of course, they can overlap. Um, it, that kind of spurred on the, the goals uh, to try something new, but with a promise that you only have to pay if there's success. And so in some contexts, you actually didn't have the funds to scale up. Um, and so that this provided an opportunity because if it's successful, then you might actually have, have, have received what in the field sometimes is called bankable savings from delivering the outcomes. And therefore, you know, you ended up getting something um, that on net was a benefit for everybody. Those are that's kind of like one of those uh, goal stories of if th what if this works well, this is what it could do for us. The other part was just a political constraint. You may have had it to be politically popular to write the contract as a pay for success contract, as opposed to a contract that um, where the government just simply you know, tries it, evaluates it, and then decides if it wants to, to do it. So the fact that it, it was written in that way may have alleviated some of the political issues. I think the other reasons people have looked toward social impact bonds um, is, is either in kind of two categories. One is that you actually might have wanted to you know, kind of put money toward innovation and this put it kind of in a bucket where there's a contract and, you know, we can try something new and so forth. And this might be kind of a safe way to try it um, where everyone can agree. Um, the other way that it's been thought of is not just some kind of just like, okay, we're going to try something new, but we're actually trying to accelerate the speed of social innovation. And one of the things here in the U.S. that you know, has been a complaint in, in many contexts is that philanthropy has actually funded some really interesting, innovative programs. Um, they've even been evaluated rigorously, but they've just sat on the shelf because um, there was no connection between government specifically, which may have needed to be one of the, the entities to scale up those promising programs. And so there's some kind of push from philanthropy to say, well, let's all get together and kind of, it's almost a promise. Like if we demonstrate it works within the context of government being involved, then there might be a, a more rapid kind of path toward diffusion. And this, you know, from the government side, again, it looks like, it looks good to have philanthropy paying up front and so forth. So, you know, these are all questions that we, you know, are beginning to be able to answer through research um, because the sheer number of social impact bonds is not large. You know, it, it takes, you know, a little bit of time uh, to be able to look back and assess, you know, has have the tool, the social impact bond achieved the promises that some of the advocates early on have um, advanced. So this is, um, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, government's across the globe tend to be very risk averse. Um, and this is a way to sort of mitigate the risk for governments or for politicians. It seems like a really <laughs> a no brainer, but um, you know, I think there are some financial risks, but you know, it also seems like there might be some risks for communities. Um, is that sort of, um, you know, addressed in the contract and in the the types of measurements that are used to, you know, say this is was a successful program. I guess just some quick thoughts on that. I mean, it's hard to know for sure if the risks to the community are either more or less than existing structures around service delivery. So to that end, it's 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 hard to point a finger. I think instead we can begin to point a finger at how to improve social impact bond contracting structures to make it more inclusive than it was in the past. Uh, but but I, I think it's really an open question about whether this structure is by its construction more or less inclusive than existing structures for service delivery. Although I think in the UK, there's probably a, a more critical group out there who, who are more skeptical of social impact models. I mean, Sue, you may want to say something because certainly you've you know, you've recently commissioned a, a special edition of a journal on social impact bonds and 
looked at some of the kind of critiques. Um, I mean, I mean, it, I, th- I think there's a bit more of a critical edge around social impact bonds in the UK, wouldn't you say? Uh, I think so, and a lot of that comes from academia, but also sometimes from practitioners, particularly in the social economy. Um, yeah, I, I, I was guest editor along with um, seven or eight other people, some British and, and, and some American, in fact, of um, a themed issue of a, a journal, uh, of a collection of pieces on, on certain aspects of social impact bonds. And I think overall, the tone was quite critical. Um, some of it was about the issue I mentioned before about transparency. And while it isn't always the case that there are criticisms that some uh, social impact funds in the UK haven't been very transparent and that the, who's paying the costs and who's gaining is, can be rather hidden. Um, but it, there are quite vocal uh, groups who are quite ideologically opposed to social impact bonds because they're equated with the privatisation and marketization of the, the, the public services, which is a big debate in the UK, not uh, entirely around social impact bonds, but the uh, that's tapped into. That actually gets at one of the the questions that I had about um, uh, sort of continuing this sort of market based uh, determination of what gets funded, um, and so that is a, a real criticism. Um, so, what are the things that um, research is coming up with that um, can help mitigate that uh, that concern? Well, I wonder whether this is a good point to talk a little bit about a couple of the ideas in the, the new series that we're, we're publishing at the moment. And I think one of the ideas that we are very interested in is, is the role of co-creation uh, of service delivery models. Um, now, the early SIBs didn't involve much co-creation. They were quite top down. They were, as Gary alluded to, kind of discussions between a range of stakeholders, but a relatively you know, small group of government officials, uh, maybe who are going to be paying, whether they're from local or national government, uh, philanthropists who are going to be investing, and then service providers who are going to be delivering, but not many people beyond that. One of the ideas we've been very interested in um, is the potential for more co-creation with people who use those services and with communities that are influenced by those services to increase the rate of innovation in social impact bonds because a lot of the literature on innovation particularly social innovation emphasizes the role of communities and people with lived experience in developing ideas solutions to the problems that they face but also of course at the same time co-creation encourages transparency and uh, clarity about what is uh, what it what is it what is at stake and, and what the aim of a, of a program is so I think for us co-creation is certainly one of the emerging ideas in this field and we've been looking in the UK at some quite innovative social impact bonds uh, that have been developed really over the last two or three years where there is much more of a move towards greater involvement of people with lived experience, uh, greater involvement of people who use services and moving to what are sometimes called asset-based or strengths-based ways of working with people. So very much engaging with people around not just the problems that they have, but also how they might use the the resources they have to to help tackle those problems and and the role of public services then being to support that process rather than impose a solution on people. I guess one one thought, Aubrey, that comes to mind. I mean, we already have, uh, in the U.S. anyway, kind of a marketized economy, if I'm to blend a U.K. word with uh, what we we have over here in the U.S. So I don't think that the tool itself is probably going to shift us more in that direction vis-a-vis other tools. I mean, we've been outsourcing public service, social service for a really long time. Um, I think the the potential with the social outcome or social impact bond is that you're specifying the outcome. You're actually having a conversation about the outcome. And, and to Chris's point, we've had in the last decade too limited group of stakeholders to have that conversation about the outcome. So that really has the potential to move things forward. I think what's challenging about the tool is that some of the outcomes that this process might settle on are, 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 are the outcomes are actually 
perhaps hard to measure in the short term, the duration of the contract. Um, and so then you may have to actually tie the payment of the contract to an output, which you can observe, but is not quite the outcome. And, and I think that's a tension that we have in public sector, social sector anyway, is are we going to be focused on outputs, even inputs in, in many cases, um, like who are we actually serving and just counting those people and so forth, um, but to actually move toward outcomes. And, and I think that's you know an open question about whether this structure has the ability to shift our thinking in the way Chris described earlier. Um, it, it is, you know, I think a, a laudable goal for how we're thinking about our public service, our social sector, to shift toward thinking about outcomes much more directly and not necessarily just the, the inputs and outputs of any particular service. So, so I think that's that's where I feel optimistic in kind of bringing that conversation to a broader audience. The tool is one way to do that, but certainly not the only way to do that within the, you know, the overall social sector. What you said just got me thinking about um, a few years ago, uh, social innovation brought Rucker Johnson uh, to campus to to give some talks and, and Rucker Johnson was talking about um, his book, which is about desegregation and the, the long-term effects of desegregation and how, you know, uh, in the U.S. we didn't really give it much of a chance. <laughs> and, you know, we've gone back to a lot more segregation and how the long-term effects that he could measure, um, you know, really were so positive and yet we're so stuck in looking at the, the now. It's a really um, um, hard thing to measure. Um, it also got me thinking, and this is the UK, that series, um, the Seven Up series, <laughs> Now, see, I'm going all over the place. Sorry, that's the way my brain works, um, which is why I'm not an academic. But, um, you know, the importance of sort of these long term studies. And so are there ways that you could get the the long term outcomes um, you know, into the contract? Is that something that you could put a little bit aside that, you know, if um you know, there's some sort of measure of success, whether it be mobility or, um, you know, long term being in a job or, you know, whatever it is, um, that then the payments can be later. Um, is that something that's being talked about? Yeah. Or I mean, certainly some some SIBs are longer term. Um, so some of the SIBs that are being developed in the UK around sort of well-being and uh supporting people with chronic health conditions are certainly longer term they're sort of five year plus contracts rather than sort of the earlier ones which tended to be two or three years still relatively short term obviously uh but but often a little bit longer term than traditional commissioning which which is often annual or, or at the best sort of every other year or something like that um so there's a little bit of a move towards that but probably not the really long term thinking that you're suggesting i think what what we have seen though is um in the uk is quite a lot of thought about what you might call intermediate outcomes trying to be more evidence based and thinking through what the shorter term intermediate outcomes are that are indicators of long term success so often those are are things like building people's um, confidence or resilience, building people's ability to access services, and then, uh, you know, to some extent using research to show that where we build people's capabilities, where we give people better access to services, where we educate people, that has long-term benefits, which may not be possible to measure within the, the lifetime of the SIB, but nevertheless, we can be reasonably confident that, that if we get those things right, the longer-term measures will will transpire eventually um so so there are there are sort of ways i think around around some of those issues the sibs that we've been looking at recently use something called a rate card so they don't just have a single outcome or one or two outcomes they actually have quite a a kind of a a, a, a broad selection of possible outcomes and the idea is that as you work with individuals you can be you know, tailoring what you do with individual people to a range of possible outcomes on the rate card, each of which has a payment associated with it. So it might be access to a particular treatment service or um, sustaining a tenancy in supported housing for a certain length of time or 
uh, you know, um, doing a, a, a program of exercise over a certain period, whatever it might be, you have a rate, quite a range of possible outcomes. And it's down to the frontline practitioner to then work with individuals and, and then have the ability to, to sort of link that individual to a combination of those outcomes. So again, you're building some flexibility in there. And, and that then hopefully starts to, by personalising, by sort of tailoring the service to the individual, again, you start to address some of those kind of issues. I think in in part, in uh, just to echo, we, we have seen, especially in the education SIBs, you know, intermediate outcomes that are paying off in, you know, four or five years with the expectation that, you know, in the future, you'll actually have even, you know, additional payments in 10 years and so forth. But I think that in part, you could imagine it going one of two ways. You could either just kind of recognize that SIBs may not be the best tool for certain kinds of outcomes that you're trying to achieve and that you need to use other mechanisms and and tools to achieve that. Um, And therefore, SIBs end up being in a category of of, tools that focus on innovation in these spaces, that focus on... um, you know, the kinds of outcomes that you can observe within a short period, you know, I think it's fine to imagine kind of this tool settling in these spaces um, and not necessarily covering all complex problems or even more straightforward problems where you have the kind of constraints that we talked about before. I think it really remains to be seen kind of where we end up. And I I think we see this often in social innovation where you have these expectations put on a new tool that range the gamut and are, of course, impossible to meet all of them. Um, but they also, those expectations are there so that if you fail on one of them, you know, like you wanted to be super innovative or the tool actually, you know, doesn't get the outcome that you want, but you're like, well, but it still achieves something else. And we saw that with microcredit when it came to the U.S. And I did some research 20 years ago on this, and that was, you know, very much the case. And so it was like, as, as some say, deja vu all over again, when we were, you know, looking at SIBs in this way and the advocates were saying, it can do this, 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 and this. And so what's, what's nice about where we are now, we can begin to look back and say, you know what, these are the things that it probably can't do. So for instance, in my view, it doesn't do a great job of sharing risk for the public sector. I think ultimately the public sector isn't on the hook one way or another. Um, <laughs> If you don't achieve the outcome, then they'll you'll be asked, well, why didn't you achieve the outcome? You could have done the standard of care and or whatever the case might be. And if you do achieve the outcome, then you're going to pay. So I, I think there's some of these contexts where I think we're understanding, well, it's it might be good at this, but it's not so good at that. So I think that gets me to the next question is the, the question of accountability. So, you know, you're sort of hinting that... Um, you know, the accountability isn't going to really lie in the public sector. Um, But where is the accountability? Is it with the providers, the investors, the community? (laughs) Those are very good points. And um, Gary was mentioning earlier some of the ways in which um, transparency and accountability are not the same thing, but they often go together. And you you were saying that contracts are, for example, very um, uh, publicly available. Um, that anyone can review them and uh, comment on them. I don't think that's particularly always the case in the UK, is my understanding. But, uh, uh, and there has been you know, criticisms that what some have actually sort of move money around mm-hmm. rather than provide new money that um, uh, local government likes it because it opens up opportunities that... Uh, wouldn't exist otherwise, but it's it's not necessarily new investment. It's recycled uh, in, in other places the government might have invested in. And there's a kind of notion that you know, that that's not particularly transparent. You can celebrate you done a good job and you've achieved something, but you don't uh, uh, necessarily get points about you know, at least in that way. And what alternatives there might have been. I mean, Gary, you want to say something? Go ahead. No, I, I think I think Sue made the point and kind of made it earlier. I I think no matter what the we we ought to think about accountability whenever we're you know providing public services. Um, and I again I, I tend to think that these contracts, especially if you make them public, are are probably as good as other approaches for just accountability in terms of the process, the outcome, and so forth. But I think 
until we bring in you know a broader set of stakeholders to define the outcomes, I think we're we're likely um, to remain unhappy with kind of the process in the sense that it it, it might seem distant from especially either users, but just the community from which into which the services are being provided. So I think that's a real opportunity for growth. So we talked about co-creation. Are there other th- other um, findings that you, you already have um, to make the process um, more transparent? Yeah. I mean, I think we've, so we've, we've, we've looked quite a lot at the, the way in which SIBs can be, evaluated uh, different ways of both measuring and evaluating effectiveness. And, and that's certainly, I think, something where we've now got a reasonable amount of evidence of different approaches and how effective they are. I mean, essentially, the arguments are that, you know, you, you might ideally want to attach rigorous impact evaluations like randomized control trials or similar to SIBs. But of course, if you continue to do that, uh, you, you, you set very high transaction costs around these kind of approaches. And so in the long term, uh, that, that makes the SIB even harder to, to really kind of develop and, and embed. Um, if you don't go down that route and you focus on uh, better management systems and information systems uh, in order to understand what's being achieved but rely less on evaluation, the whole process is maybe a bit, a bit, a bit faster, a bit more streamlined, but you know, as as researchers, we then still 10 years on only have a relatively small number of rigorous evaluations that really get to the heart of whether or not SIBs have delivered outcomes. And we can attribute properly what we see to the intervention as opposed to whatever else might be going on in that that place or in that service. So so there are kind of swings and roundabouts there. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. Certainly, the some of the contributions we've had to the current series, where contributors have looked at how SIBs are developing in other parts of the world, is quite interesting. Um, we have an, an interesting briefing uh, looking at some of the developments in Europe, where uh, SIBs are at an earlier stage, but but various countries in Europe are starting to experiment with them, and um, you know, th- th- there's much less emphasis, I think, on formal evaluation there. We've also got some interesting contributions about the early uh, thinking on SIBs in places like Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And again, they're going in quite different directions. They're probably a more managerial uh, top-down model of SIB, less less involvement of of service users and communities, I think, um, if anything, narrowing the group of players involved, but probably also operating at much larger scale than SIBs we've typically seen so far. Uh, but again, not really using evaluation, much more of a management model there to understand outcomes. So there are, there are, there are sort of different possibilities here. I mean, one thing that I, I, I think will be helpful again, like is we, we've seen oper- SIBs operate in different contexts through one we might focus on an innovation process. So for instance, um, we're seeing in, you know, we had um, Alec Frazier speak to our community um, social innovation here at Price not too long ago, and he contributed to this series and is looking at SIBs in Europe in the series. And one of the things that he noted was that there he's seen more instances of early stage innovation happening. Um, and in that context, it makes absolutely no sense to use randomized control trials to assess early stage innovation. Instead, you will use kind of metrics and rate cards and these kinds of things to say, are you hitting kind of these possibilities? If so, this is something that we want to invest in more. Um, And so, you know, we shouldn't criticize that, you know, not all SIBs are using randomized control trials if some of the SIBs are really focused on early stage innovation. On the other hand, if the goal, you know, of parties in some cases in in Asia, it sounds like, you know, these larger scale kind of things um, in the U.S., you know, what we saw is that 91% of the first 25 SIBs were focused on either scaling up promising pilots in the U.S. or taking examples of programs working in other states and then transferring them here. In those contexts, if you're in a jurisdiction where you're looking to actually um, scale up or get diffused a promising practice, then you do want to bring that standard of evidence there. And so, you know, I, I, I don't want to 
yeah, I, I would want to respond to those who criticize SIBs for not, you know, having rigorous evaluation to kind of direct their comments to in the places that we ought to, if they're not doing it, that is a good, a valid criticism. But if we're really using a SIB to kind of create an ecosystem for early stage innovation, then we, we actually need different tools and metrics. Great point. So at this point, um, I want to ask, um, what haven't we talked about yet? What haven't I asked that I should ask? Well, I wonder, Chris, if you you might think through, you know, the the briefing that we're launching today with the first, you know, two briefs, and then we're going to be uh, a series of them over time. And I think there's some really interesting things there, Chris. You want to share some first, and then I'll share. Yeah, well, and I think Sue will want to sort of join in this, but I think I think one of the things that comes across strongly in the briefings we're releasing this week and actually next week as well is the potential for social impact bonds, particularly in, in the UK and Europe, to be a catalyst for broader public service reform, not just because they uh, create new innovative services that others might then adopt, but because they do something more fundamental, which is that they introduce new practices into public service delivery, stronger forms of performance management, uh, but also stronger forms of, of partnership working and collaboration. And in the case of some of the SIBs we've been looking at recently, stronger forms of co-creation, co-production. And so they actually start to introduce a set of practices and ideas and, and um, principles, if you like, that really start to challenge current thinking about how public services are delivered. So then that's one really interesting theme that we're seeing. And so uh, a couple of the papers that we'll be releasing next week really focus in on that. This week, the papers we've released, um, we have a paper by Robert Pollock from, so well, recently of social finance. He's now recently moved on, but when he wrote the paper, he was at social finance. Um, social finance have been with SIBs all the way through the SIB journey. And um, Emily Gustafson, uh, right, who's, who's also been very involved through uh, the Brookings Institution in sort of monitoring SIBs worldwide since they started to develop. Um, and I think what both of them show in the papers they've, they've given us today is, is the potential for SIBs to be part of the response to COVID. Um, so Emily talks about the idea of um, uh, sort of SIBs being part of the response to what she calls social long COVID, some of the long term social fallout we're going to experience through the COVID pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, there's some really interesting ideas there. Robert, again, talks about how SIBs have almost been a, a 10 year rehearsal for some of the really complex social issues that we now have to tackle at a time when we're also at some point going to have to pick up the bill for the COVID pandemic and therefore there's probably going to be pressure on public services and so they both kind of see what we've done over the last 10 years as being part of the proving ground for what could be a really interesting period for SIBs being part of the solution to COVID so I think that's another interesting theme. Um, third interesting theme I think to come out of the, the two briefings that we're publishing this week from Emily and Robert is the potential role of government going forward Emily is interested in whether the, the new Biden administration will possibly be more uh, supportive of, of social impact bonds and other forms of social investment and outcome based work. Um, in the UK, we have a, 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 a what we call a comprehensive spending review, which happens every three, few years. We, we have one coming in the autumn and we understand that the government will probably be interested to further support the ongoing development of SIBs through that review process. So. You know, there's another theme I think coming out strongly is that, you know, these are models that do need some government support in different forms. And that in both sides of the Atlantic at the moment, maybe we have opportunities to see, you know, some of that support coming through over the next few months. And so there's, a, there's an interesting policy debate to be had at the moment around social impact bonds. Sue, do you want to share some thoughts and then I can also share? Um, no, they're, they're, those are really good points. And I, I mean, arguably, SIBs did grow out of a previous crisis, which with hindsight doesn't look such a terrifying one as, as COVID, but the financial crisis of 2007 8. Um, and, and one way of framing SIBs would be, you know, they've had their 10 years, you know, they're quite interesting, did some good stuff, had some criticisms, but actually they weren't the, as you were saying before, they weren't the fix-all solution that some people hoped they would be. Um, I mean, that would be one point of view, they've, they've sort of run out of steam, but the other is, Chris, it's 
um, which, which looks more plausible that you know, really you know new new thinking and new ways of interacting with service providers, governments, third sector people who use the services are, are, are desperately needed, and, and this is at least one uh, mechanism by which that could be achieved. Yeah, I think I just want to emphasize, you know, a point that that Chris made as we're thinking about the tool social impact bonds or in the developing world, the developing impact bond approach, you know, it, it really, depending on the, the country and context, there are very different goals, actually. Um, and if it's public service reform as the goal, as in Finland uh, uh, or in the UK or in other countries in Asia, that's quite different than, you know, early stage innovation, if that's the goal. And, and so I, I really I really anticipate as a maturity of the tool um, and, and, and in hopeful that with that maturity, we'll see lower transaction cost around creating the tool itself. Um, and perhaps those those you know kind of stakeholder engagement costs can be viewed as you know just part of the process of social change. And you know, the SIB kind of uh, construct, if you will, could actually help test those kinds of models as it relates to coming to um, agreement about what outcomes so the social sector ought to be uh, you know focusing on. I don't know that you know you necessarily need a sim structure to get to that, but we absolutely need more models of that of co-creation, co-production in order to to move forward. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think Chris's point is a, an interesting one. Uh, myself and, and my colleague, Megan Goulding, who uh, works in the Price Center, but also is completing her uh, doctorate in policy planning and development uh, next year. You know, we, we also focused on kind of the potential for SIBs as it relates to the COVID crisis. And in some parts, what we saw in COVID was a, a more stark example of the inequalities that existed in 2019. Um, and so it really can you know, point a laser focus on issues that just haven't been addressed you know, in, in, in a direct manner. So you know, one such issue, you know, we, we've seen SIBs emerge around re-entry. So people who are incarcerated who come out of incarceration, but what we, we've seen with SIBs is that people who have even you know, been arrested at some point um, are seeing unemployment rates that are vastly above those that, that had not. And so you see that barrier to employment being exasperated. And I think that we could imagine SIBs engaging in the workforce space in ways that they didn't before. Or really what we're talking about is what, what are ways that we can see social investment attack these spaces that, you know, just weren't weren't as big before. Um, another place that you could imagine SIBs um, that we talk about is in kind of bridging the digital divide. You know, it could be the case that we just simply, you know, as has been argued by many, including myself, we just, you know, look at broadband as a utility and we just implement it. We don't need a SIB to do that. We just do it, right? But it could be the case that in some areas, rural areas or other areas that we, we actually need you know, the kind of demonstration project that SIBs could actually be well suited um, in order to kind of show what does it mean when we actually, you know, bridge the digital divide in this community or in that community. So it's just an example of what we hope is a tool that can accelerate, you know, these broader changes that the, the pandemic really revealed. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets me thinking about, um, we've, we've talked about, um, homelessness a few times um, and, you know, the economic roundtables, you know, looking at the 2008 crisis and how several years after that, there was more homelessness tied to the crisis. Um, and this seems to be um, one of the things that you could tackle. Um, but how do you, um, so this is a, a sort of an academic question. Um, you know, the, the findings of research um, suggest some best practices. How do we make sure that those best practices, those, those ideas are connecting with the philanthropists, with the investors, with, with government? How do we make sure that we're, you know, sort of 
heading in the direction we know we should be heading. So we know that we um, are probably going to be seeing, you know, a rise in homelessness in the next three years. So uh, we know that we should be focusing on housing and jobs. How do we make sure that we're doing that? Is that something that Sid can help with? Yeah, I think so in the sense that because of the rigour that SIBs require in terms of clarity around how inputs, outputs and outcomes are related and whether or not they have been demonstrated. And of course, you know, the rigour around showing the the cost effectiveness of, of, of an intervention. Uh, certainly in the UK, one of the ways SIBs can be useful is, is to sort of demonstrate to policymakers the potential of an intervention or an approach or a different way of working with a particular group of people. Um, and so they, they certainly have that potential. Um, we need to keep pulling together the learning. So I think, you know, the work that um, Emily Gustafson-Wright and colleagues at the Brookings Institution are doing and have done over the last few years is really important. Their, their reviews of what's happening worldwide on SIBs and their pulling together of the evidence really helpful. Uh, similarly, in the UK, um, social finance and the, the Go Lab at Oxford University have, have, have both had roles in doing that as well. So I think those kind of things are important to keep putting the evidence base together. Um, and then, you know, I think beyond that, getting as much transparency as we can within SIBs so that people can use the learning, people can see the business case that was being tested, people can see the results that were achieved and look at the the, the, the finance behind it and work out what, what the real cost was. All of those things help, I think, in making the case to policymakers. And then finally, I think, you know, and, and we're hoping to do some of this ourselves, people need to come together and, and pull together the learning in, in accessible ways. And hopefully the, the briefing series we're putting out this month are, you know, very much accessible papers that, that policymakers can pick up. Uh, they're short, they're hopefully reasonably to the point, and they give policymakers an overview of some of the different elements of the SIB debate. I think that this is a space that I might be considered somewhat Pollyannish um, as it relates to kind of SIB's role. Um, you, you spoke to a, a real challenge that we have had in our public systems and social sector for a long time is that if there's promising practices, how do you diffuse them into, you know, larger systems of, of service? Um, I think that's that's a real opportunity for SIBs, and that's that sort of stakeholder engagement that exists because investors and service providers and and the government, and as we're arguing is necessary for SIBs 2.0, the next 10 years, the more, more of the community involved in co-creation, that provides kind of a, an ecosystem for much more rapid diffusion. And we have seen, you know, the ad hoc examples of you know, SIBs that didn't even complete in Belgium, for instance, which is a workforce SIB called Duo for a Job, they had promising practices. And, you know, Belgium is such a small country relative to like the U.S., for instance, they just changed their pra practices immediately because the government was tracking us very closely. And because it was so much better than the standard, they just switched over to that program um, as their standard workforce development program. And so I think it has that real potential um, for much more rapid diffusion than some of our other approaches have been. You know, I, I think um, those of us in the academy have, have, have basically, you know, made an argument that we've seen proven false. Like if we just use the rigor, most rigorous evidence and show something works, it will be adopted. Right. And we just keep putting it in front of people. We even write policy memos to say, look, this works, this works, this works. But it turns out that the implementation of promising practices itself is an entire field of study. And, and I think that SIBs could fit there in ways that maybe they haven't been given credit for. With that said, again, there's been too few to make a definitive statement about this. Um, some other kind of just interview evidence that we've received here in the States is that um, some of the government kind of back in pairs have said that we loved the fact that the stakeholder engagement was kind of created in a way that didn't exist before. We wish we didn't have to, in, in some sense, take the time and money to write up a contract to guarantee that sort of stakeholder engagement. Um, and, and that might well might be the case, um, but what mechanism are you going to get um, to get that stakeholder engagement that led to more rapid diffusion of promising practices? So, so I think that's a, a, a real interesting place for us to look at vis-a-vis um, -vis research in the next decade. 
my my last question was going to be what is the role of of academics in this process so uh, i think you got to a little bit of that but um you know what is um an academic's responsibility to the community as well promoting learning essentially we need to do that in obvious ways for students and so on but it, 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 it's bringing not only evaluation, and, uh, which it obviously does as well, but um, to engender learning and to create opportunities for learning, connect with people who are willing and interested to learn. And there are many mechanisms for doing that, but it isn't writing papers in journals that only other academics read, but we have to do that as well. It, 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 it's been very um, outgoing and uh, using different channels. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that. That's certainly always been a, a focus of our research unit to, to do the research, but then also to really think about how we can work with policymakers, decision makers to, to make sure it's useful to them to essentially co-create, co co-produce with people that knowledge get involved in the learning process. We, we learn, they learn, and, and, you know, so the process goes on. I think that when you're talking about, I, I, and I would just say, you know, within a field of social innovation more broadly, I think what Chris said is important to emphasize is that we become kind of part of the co-creation process. Um, and there's, it, we're almost incumbent upon academics to step into those spaces that, you know, we have not traditionally stepped into to kind of learn with people as these new tools are being tested and so forth. I think it's also appropriate to say the role of, you know, the academic is to criticize um, and to be, you know, justifiably cautious with kind of where people might be taking a particular tool and so forth and to say, no, this is not what it's doing but this is what we're seeing, you know, it's effective over here, it's not effective there. I think it's really important because tools that are new like this um, can also flit away. Um, and they can flit away for reasons, not because they were ineffective, but because there's just the new quote unquote fad on social investment that kind of overwhelms it. And so everyone kind of turns their head. So as academics, I think it's incumbent upon us to kind of note what SIBs are really good at doing um, and how they fit it within the innovation process. And then, you know, what SIBs aren't as good at doing um, so that we can kind of balance out the advocacy for the tool, which has come from all sectors, service providers, the government, philanthropy, et cetera, um, with the actual, you know, kind of outcomes of the SIB process. So it, I think the academics in this context actually play these two roles of being co-creators um, with the tool, but also, you know, the opportunity to to be reflective. So anything else we should talk about before we sign off today? I think we've, I think we've covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've, I think we've touched on all of the briefings, actually, pretty much. I mean, obviously, we haven't published all of them yet, but probably by the time this goes out, we will pretty much, I would imagine. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we've touched on the themes across all of them pretty much. So that's nice. Um, yeah, no, I think that, that's good. Excellent. The, the thing I'd like to emphasize, Aubrey, I mean, what's exciting about this tool, the SIB or the DIB, the Development Impact Bond, is that it itself is somewhat generic and who engages with it and so forth can be constructed within a local context. And so I would encourage all the listeners to actually sit down with the full briefing series. They're all very short. And if you want to learn what's happening in different countries and think about the reflections on the past and what the future ought to look like, it really is a tool that really benefits from being tested within these different institutional con constructs. And it's still emerging in many, many countries. So it's hard to, you know, again, classify it as a tool of innovation or a tool of public sector reform. But but I think that, you know, our listeners will enjoy reading kind of how it's been deployed in these different contexts and, and learn from that. And we will definitely have all of the links on the show page. So thanks, Aubrey. All right. Sue, any last words? I'm struggling to think of anything we haven't said. It's been a I very, know. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's been a good discussion. conversation. <laughs> it's been a great conversation. And I really appreciate you all taking um, your time with me today. So um Thank you again, um, and thanks for joining us at the big, the bigger picture. Uh, so for links, uh, 
to some of the things we talked about, visit our show page, which is bedrosian.usc.edu slash big picture. If you have any questions for our speakers or topics you'd like us to cover, let us know. You can check out our website, social media, or you can even email us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast. Subscribe to our channel on uh, to our playlist on YouTube. Leave a review so that other people can find us. And please share. If you're interested in SIBs, please, please share. Um, until we catch up again, uh, we hope that you will take care of yourself and your neighbors. So from all of us at the USC Pedrosian Center, thank you. <laughs>